In the second lecture, we are going to complete uh, the development of a model, a simple model for our brushed DC motor. Uh, let me uh, start off by returning to what we had uh, concluded with in our last uh, and first uh, lesson on a brushed DC motor. And that was that um, when the motor shaft is spun at some rate, uh, which we can uh, we see right here. We produce an induced voltage, coil voltage, called E-coil. That coil voltage is sinusoidal in nature, and it is proportional to a constant that is specific to the motor. We call it Km, but it's, it's related to the geometries of the motor, the magnetic field of the permanent magnets, the number of turns, in the coil, uh, and other things like that. Um, and what the reason I say other things like that is because in a real motor, uh, there will be some additional factors that enter into this motor constant, but in the end, there will be a motor, a lumped parameter, that if we can determine what that parameter is, or we are given that parameter, then we can actually um, not have to consider the underlying uh, parameters and physics that led to that lump parameter. We can just use that lump parameter. Okay, so this induced voltage is proportional to this motor constant. It's proportional to the speed of the motor. So if you spin the motor faster, twice as fast, the amplitude of the sinusoidal voltage that's produced will be twice as fast, or twice as much. And then, as mentioned already, the voltage is actually sinusoidal. It's cosine omega mt, where omega m is the angular frequency of our motor, and we're using this uh, this theta m here, and omega m is the time rate of change of theta m. Okay, so we have this sinusoidal this sinusoidal voltage that's produced. Now we know that well, hopefully, uh, may maybe you don't know this, but if you take a DC motor and you actually spin the shaft and you were to look at the voltage at the terminals, you would not see a sinusoidal voltage. You would in fact see a DC voltage. Now if you looked at that voltage very carefully, what you would see is uh, something like like this. So if I looked at the uh, the voltage in time, okay, this would be V coil, I'll say open circuit, so nothing is connected to the terminal of the, of the motor, I just have a motor, I have a shaft, and I'm going to spin it at some omega m, and I have two terminals, a plus and a minus, and I'm going to measure this voltage here. Then I will have almost a DC voltage, but if I zoom into it, what I would find is that that voltage has little, little crests to them, okay? And they actually are part of a sinusoidal peak, multiple sinusoidal peaks that are actually overlapping one another. And this goes back to the fact that we have multiple poles. Multiple poles on our rotor. We have just one magnetic field, one B naught. Uh, right here the stator magnet, stator magnet. So there's one B field that crosses, cuts through the rotor, but we have multiple uh, poles to our, our rotor. And again, an actual motor uh, construction is going to actually have an armature, this metal frame that's ferromagnetic, typically iron or some kind of iron-based um, uh, metal, and then there's going to be windings wrapped around uh, each of these armature uh, poles. And just like you'd wrap a wire around a na nail to magnetize it, that's what we're doing, uh, what's happening in this case. But there are multiple poles, and I'm not sure um, how many there are on a, a typical DC motor. I, I should know that, but I'm thinking maybe there's you know, four or six. I confess I haven't, I haven't checked. But regardless, however many poles there are, um, you will have some ripple. And of course, the more poles you have, the smaller that ripple would be. 
And uh, for our purposes, we can, and for many applications, you can ignore the fact that there's actually a ripple. And you can just simply measure the DC voltage. And this DC voltage that is going to be generated, call it V, in this case, this is going to be, call this E coil. Oh, I can't see that. Um, there we go. E coil. We are going to call this E coil, or actually, I'm going to call it EA. I'm not going to call it E coil because that'll confuse it with our E coil from previously. A is for armature. This comes from E coil, but what we're now going to be describing is what is this roughly DC voltage that is generated if I spin my motor shaft at a frequency omega m. Well, EA turns out to be KM of my motor times omega m. And there is no cosine omega mt. And the reason is, again, because we have multiple poles. The generated voltages are overlapping. And the commutator essentially connects any particular winding to our external two terminals of the motor only for the crest portion, the peak portion of each sinusoidal phase, and thereby generating effectively this DC voltage. Okay, so we have a very simple expression. The induced voltage, armature voltage, is EA equal to KM, the motor constant, times omega M. And now we will redraw this motor model that I started last time. We have a voltage source. This is the induced voltage due to Faraday's law of induction, and it's, it has a voltage equal to EA. And that voltage is Km times omega m. We also have winding resistance, Ra, or R coil. I'm going to use A because it's shorter, but A again is for armature. That's why it's commonly used. And then lastly, we haven't talked about this yet, but there will also be a resistance, I mean an inductance, excuse me an inductance due to this coil. Oftentimes we'll be able to justify that away, but I'm going to add it to this model currently. Sorry. Okay. So this is the electrical side of our motor. There's not that much to it. Let me label the current. I'll call it IA, which is again armature current. It's the same current as I'd called previously I coil. However, I don't want to confuse it with the single phase, the current and voltage of our single phase um, motor that we had, non-commutating motor that we had uh, introduced in the last lecture. So I'm going to call it IA and EA. We're now ready to develop the mechanical side of our electric motor. So this is going to draw upon the rotational uh, dynamic systems that we have uh, looked at uh, up to this point. And um, with that in hand, it shouldn't take too long to, to produce this, this mechanical side of the model. So what we begin with is the recognition that, as we saw in the first part of this uh, series, uh, that a torque is induced on the rotor due to current flowing. We found that the current was, uh, if I go back and highlight that, the current is, or the torque, is equal to the motor constant times the coil current times cosine theta m. We saw then that the actual current, or the actual torque, that flowed let me clutter this now. Okay, the actual torque, not that flowed, but the actual torque that was exerted was maximum when our 
uh, motor shaft um, angular position was at zero degrees, and it was minimum at plus pi over 2 and minus pi over 2. And um, we noted also that um, it was most efficient to actually apply a current through the coil only in the region around uh, the theta m equal to zero because as we moved closer to pi over two and minus pi over two more and more of the voltage uh, that was applied externally was uh, was ended up being applied across the coil resistor and that was a very lossy mechanism so um, let me let's go back and review this for a second if we assume that we are applying a coil voltage of V coil external coil, coil voltage of V coil say one volt here and we have an induced voltage uh, which is this blue trace we see that at theta m equal to zero is where there's a minimum voltage between the externally applied voltage and the um, induced voltage and that difference whether it's at that minimum or at the maximum which occurs right here at minus pi over 2 or plus pi over 2 uh, where there is no induced voltage because d phi dt at that point is zero and all of the voltage that we apply externally is applied across our coil um, regardless the uh, current that is produced and the torque that is produced is ultimately uh, driven by the combination of the induced voltage and the voltage that we are applying externally as well as the coil resistance. So uh, we arrived at this expression here where we found that the coil current is going to be the external coil voltage say due to a battery minus the induced voltage in the coil divided by our coil. And now if we um, were to look at the actual torque that was produced, um, I didn't actually show this plot in the last uh, lesson, but I'll, I'll show it here. Uh, look at this blue trace right here, the blue trace. Uh, this is the case where we have a constant coil voltage. So we've applied one volt, so this is basically we've applied one volt across our external motor terminals. And we have R coil and we have E coil. And recall all of this is inside our motor. Right? This is the motor housing here. We can't ever separate our coil and e-coil. Those are actually, physically, it's just this bundle of wire that is being immersed uh, in a time-varying fashion uh, inside of a, uh, a, a static magnetic field. What we notice here is that when we apply a constant voltage as opposed to a constant current, we have a torque that is not purely sinusoidal as it was for the case where we applied a constant current. Uh, it has this interesting kind of double lobe all right, between the minus pi over 2 and the plus pi over 2. And now we need to imagine that just as in the case with the induced voltage, if we're going to have multiple phases on our motor, multiple poles, and we limit the conduction uh, of each coil to just a region that surrounds the theta m equal to zero angle, then all of these skirts here are going to be gone. We're not, gonna, we're not going to make use of that region. And so the ripple that we'll actually see in the torque um, will be this small ripple, but primarily DC. So it, let me go ahead and redraw that. It might look like something that looks like this. Right. This is with multiple poles, multi-pole rotor, okay, and commutator. 
So now we can go back to our model here. And just as we proposed a simplified expression for the induced voltage in our coil, we can now propose a simplified expression for the torque that is going to be induced. I'm going to call this tau i. This is going to be the torque that is going to be generated um, by the interaction of the current flowing through the coil of our rotor and the fixed magnetic field P0, but with the assumption of multiple poles in the commutator. This torque will be equal to Km times Ia, where Ia is the armature current noted right here. Notice that previously the torque, which you called, we called tau coil, was equal to this expression here. Right? Km and I coil, same as what we have now, but there's no longer going to be a variation over a single revolution, so there'll be no cosine theta m. Okay, so we're now ready to draw the rest of our model. I'm going to start with a torque source. And I've used this symbol, I think, before. This is my own invention. I don't know that you'll find it anywhere else, but there are different symbols that are used. Um, I use this symbol because it looks kind of like a battery, which a battery produces a voltage, which is an effort, and a torque is also an effort. So it makes sense to me to uh, label a torque source in a mechanical diagram by a symbol that looks kind of like a battery. We're going to label it tau i, and it will be equal to km times ia. This shaft will rotate at a displacement theta m and omega m, where that will be the angular frequency. Now, all we have to do is to add some other physical, mechanical properties to this rotor, to this rotating system. Now, when we look at the original uh, diagram of a brushed motor, we notice there's going to be mass. Right? There's going to be mass, mass associated with our armature, our rotor, our whole assembly that's rotating. And so that will end up resulting in a rotational inertia. So we are going to add a rotational inertia element, and we'll call it JM, M for motor. Okay. Next, we note that there's going to be some kind of friction. We don't know the friction mechanism. We've talked about viscous friction and static friction. Uh, so we're going to put both of them in there. We're going to add a B sub M for a viscous loss term. Viscous loss. Rotational inertia. And then our last uh, torque will be, we could, we could do it this way. I'm going to draw it. Uh, well I could I could draw it as a as a source over here a torque source. I'm going to label it with the orientation going the up the opposite direction as tau i because it opposes the forward motion of the shaft. The forward motion being described by this arrow that is labeled theta m comma omega m. And we'll call this tau s. S is for stiction. Could be stiction, or we could call it static. It's really a coulomb. It's a coulomb loss. Coulomb friction loss. And this friction, this torque, is not going to be a function of how fast the motor shaft spins. Um, whereas BM will uh, produce a 
uh, viscous torque loss, that is going to be equal to Bm times the angular speed omega n. Okay, so this is our complete motor model. I'm going to redraw this. Can make it a little more compact. Bring these guys together. Now we have our complete motor model. Let's note a few things about this model. Oh, I got a few things I got to label. V, M for the external motor voltage, I, A. Okay. Oh, and one last thing that we don't have on here is we don't have a way to connect a load to this. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to redraw this one more time. I'm going to draw it a little bit differently. I'm going to get rid of tau s over here. And I'm going to label, um, let's see how I'll do this. actually label this as tau i minus tau s, which is going to be equal to km times i a minus tau s. Okay. And then the last thing we'll have out here is we will apply some kind of a load. Tau load. All right, so this represents whatever it is that you're going to attach to this motor. And we're assuming at this point that the, what we're attaching is uh, some load that is uh, best represented as a, as a torque as opposed to uh, an angular uh, displacement or angular frequency. Recall that these are both effort and flow, right? So when you connect to a load, if you connect to a um, current sink, then it would be uh, like a flow. If you connect it to a voltage sink, then it would be like an effort. So we'll get into that a little bit more as we make use of this model. Let's note a few things about this model. There are six parameters. We have RA, the armature resistance, LA, armature inductance. There is KM, the motor constant. There is JM, the rotor rotational inertia. BM, the rotor viscous coefficient, loss coefficient, and tau s, which is the rotor stiction or static loss, torque loss. Now let's look, consider the units for each of these. Armature resistance will have units of ohms. Armature inductance will be Henry's. Motor constant, it's interesting, it will actually have units of Weber's, which is equal to volt seconds. And if we go back to our basic relationship uh, right here, we see that we get volts from radians per second, so 1 over seconds. So this is where you can clearly see that Km is volts seconds. However, we can also look at Km here and note that uh, it is also Newton meters, which is torque, 
divided by amps. So we could write it as Newton meters divided by amps, or you could kind of keep going with this, Newton meters over coulombs per second, etc. But what we'll use are going to be Weber's, or volt seconds. Rotational inertia, uh, for this it will be Newton meters, several sets of units work here, but I'm thinking that uh, tau is equal to J M times D omega DT, so that would be per radian per second squared. Alright. Um, okay, and then rotor viscous coefficient will be Newton meters per radian per second. Rotational stiction or static loss will be Newton meters. Okay. Okay, so we'll uh, end here shortly. Let's just look at this model and see if we can, I don't know, get a little insight into it. So the first thing to notice is that uh, there's an electrical side and there's a mechanical side. And they're coupled. They're coupled because we see that there is a mechanical element that shows up on the electrical side. What, uh, what mechanical element shows up on the electrical side? Well, we see omega m. That's a mechanical uh, state. Okay. If we go to the mechanical side, we see an electrical parameter. Right. The electrical parameter is the current. This is an electrical state. And the reason I say state is that we usually use the term state to indicate um, that there is some kind of memory. In a physical system, that often means, that actually means that there is energy storage. So it might be natural to think of, well, omega m, okay, w what energy storage in the mechanical system is related to omega m? Well, it would be one half j m times omega m squared. Right? That would be the kinetic energy stored in the rotational inertia. And we could also say that the energy stored, uh, that, that IA is an electrical state because we have kinetic energy, if you will, that is stored in the inductor as one half L A I A squared. Okay, so these are both, you can think of them as type of kinetic energy that is stored on the electrical and the mechanical side. So notice that as the motor, as, let's assume that initially there is no rotation, so omega m is zero. If there's no omega m, then this voltage here is zero when omega m is equal to zero. So when there's no omega m, the motor is stopped. We have maximum current IA flowing in because all of the current, all of the voltage of VM is going to be applied across LA and RA and what that means ultimately is it's going to eventually very quickly end up all across RA and that will drive a large current. Well, current is coupled or connected to the mechanical side. That large current will produce a large torque, tau I. The large torque will now start to produce an acceleration, an angular acceleration of the shaft as that torque is applied initially primarily to JM. And so now the shaft starts spinning. Well, as the shaft starts spinning, omega M starts growing, and it's no longer zero. As omega M grows, EA, the armature voltage, or back EMF, so this is also called back EMF, electromotive force. That's what EMF stands for. The back EMF, or EA, 
starts growing in proportion to omega m. As it grows, less of the external voltage Vm, which we're assuming is constant, less of that voltage Vm is now applied across the armature resistance Ra. And that results in less current Ia flowing. When Ia is reduced, so is tau I. And so now we have less current that is being, or less torque that is being delivered to the mechanical side. And the rate at which the rotor shaft is accelerating is decreased because there's less torque acting on Jm. Furthermore, as omega m increases, the viscous loss, or the torque due to Bm, begins to increase. Recall that tau B, the torque due to the viscous term, or viscous loss element, is equal to Bm times omega m. So now that the shaft is spinning, some of the torque that the motor is actually, that is produced from the electrical side, that is the tau i, the km times ia, some of that torque is going to be required for overcoming the viscous loss. So that leaves less torque available for further accelerating uh, the rotor, right? Because there won't be as much to go to jm. And you can see that eventually, at some point, there will reach, uh, there will be reached a terminal angular velocity. Okay, terminal angular velocity omega m where um, the torque or the current that flows is just sufficient to produce the torque that is necessary to overcome the viscous and the static loss. Okay, and we can drive that really quite quickly here. Um, in steady state In steady state, we will have that tau i will be equal to tau bm plus tau s. And this tau jm is going to be zero because d omega m dt will be zero. Okay. Tau i is equal to km times I A. Tau B M is equal to B M times omega M. And tau S is just tau S. Now what is our I A? I A, we noted previously that it's the voltage across the coil, V R A over R A. And V R A is simply the external motor voltage minus E A. But what is that? EA is related to the mechanical side. Let's go back and look at that. We see that EA is related to omega m. So we can write km times omega m. And all of that must be multiplied by km. And now we have that equal to B m times omega m plus tau s. And if we do some algebra, we can arrive at an expression for omega m. So this would be k m squared over R a times omega m. <clears throat> That's going to be over on the right side now. And on the left side, we'll be left with Km over Ra times Vm, and we'll bring tau s over on the left side. And now we can study, solve for omega m. This is going to be steady state. And will be equal to Km over Ra divided by km squared over ra plus bm, all of that times vm, and then we'll have 
minus tau s over km squared over ra plus bm. And we can rearrange this. We could write this as, let's see, km over km squared plus ra bm. Okay, and this is just going to be some constant. <clears throat> now notice that we have, um, if we plot this, I can plot omega m as a function of vm. And if vm is zero, this actually is... Um, this will actually be negative. Omega m is less, omega m can't be less than zero when vm is equal to zero, right? So clearly this solution is only going to be valid when there is enough vm to actually spin uh, this motor. Recall that this stiction torque here really is not some external torque that is going to be there present to um, to spin the motor in an opposite direction. Basically it opposes whatever direction you're trying to spin. So if the motor shaft did ever slow down to a speed of zero and start going negative, well then the polarity of tau s actually just reverses. It doesn't, it's just like, you know, think of the static friction that you had or in the Coulomb friction on a sliding, a mass sliding down a plank. Well, it opposes you if you slide it down, and it opposes if you try to push it back up. It reverses its direction to oppose whatever motion is uh, you're trying to get the plank, uh, the mass to move in. So, this equation is only valid for omega m greater than zero. Okay. So what we'll have though is something like this, where there's going to be some minimum, some minimum motor voltage that is necessary to get the um, motor to even spin at all. And then it'll be a fixed slope, and the fixed slope will be this Km over Km squared plus Ra Bm. Okay, now we could also, I won't plot it here, but another thing that would be interesting to measure would be what is the current Ia that's going to flow during this time. It will turn out that that current will actually uh, increase as well. Of course it's not hard to derive it. Uh, if you recall the Ia is equal to 1 over Ra times Vm minus um, Ea. Right? And Ea is just Km times omega m. So since we have an expression for omega m, we can actually calculate what this current uh, will be. And <clears throat> at this point, we actually can solve for a lot of interesting things about this motor. If we know the motor parameters, we can start looking at what is the input power. Um, we haven't yet looked at loading the motor, so in steady state, what I should have put here is I should have added uh, plus tau load, right? But of course that adds in just with tau s, so I can go to my last expression here and just say this is plus tau load. So if we applied an external load, we can now start using these expressions to derive like input power and output power and what is the maximum efficiency of the motor, and what is the maximum output power of the motor, and we arrive at some useful, what's known as motor curves, which will be something that we'll develop in the future. Um, I'll end by just returning to the motor model and the six parameters. So in this, uh, this accompanying project that uh, you are working on, if you're in the uh, the engineering course, you will actually be um, testing a motor that will be provided you. And in those tests, you will be, the goal of those tests will be to derive, or it will be to determine the six 
parameters of your motor. And there are experiments that you will need to design in order to extract those motor parameters. In a future uh, lesson, I'll go over how we might arrive at those, um, those tests that will produce those motor parameters. But uh, I just wanted to point out that before we can use a, mo a model like this to actually do some useful design of an ultimate electric drivetrain, uh, we will need to determine the parameters associated with the motor that we will be using. Sometimes the manufacturers of these motors will provide this information for us. Of course, if it's a, if it's a commercial or uh, uh, an industrial motor, a uh, higher power motor, not some toy, then these parameters are oftentimes provided and even more is provided. But we're using little cheap motors. Uh, there's no data on these, or very little. And so we're going to have to run the experiments to actually determine uh, these parameters. It's not hard to actually run the test. The challenging part, if there is one, is that of coming up with the proper experiments that allow you to best extract these parameters. The actual data collection is not uh, difficult or time consuming. So that's all for now. Uh, and we'll uh, pick it up next time, um, likely uh, by coupling or looking at this model uh, from a block diagram perspective and then later we will couple this with a uh, gearbox and ultimately an, a vehicle, so a vehicle chassis with uh, wheels and, and vehicle mass and so forth, and we'll arrive at a complete uh, model for a drivetrain, an electric drivetrain.